The AD is here. You know, she was probably she was probably using NTP.
So she would be like, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. We officially call this Babel working group meeting into. Yes. All right. Stop babbling. <laughs> it's, it's time to start the Babel working group. <laughs> No, but that doesn't think it's defying us too long. How many engineers does it take to make technology work? Stands here so we can start now. <laughs> so this is the Babel working group. This is where we babble. There's the mailing address. There's the note. Well, we're going to give you five seconds to read it. There will be a test at the end of the working group. They took me seriously and started reading it. <laughs> Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, go ahead. And if you'd like to get your document reviewed, please review other people's documents, basically. Because we do need people to review documents. This is a pretty small working group, so having everyone review is pretty important, actually. All right. Agenda. I'll give you back the mic because you know the agenda. Okay, so um, although it remains to be seen, it looks like we have a reasonable amount of time at this session. Uh, some of the time from this chart, well, it's less than the time scheduled for the session, so everything must be okay. <laughs> the, uh, anybody wish to add topics or ask the agenda around or something like that? I guess not. So I'll just uh, real quick talk about the uh, document status and release uh, and milestone status. So we have uh, a couple of working group documents, which are basically the RFCs. Uh, well, the, what is the RFC on its way to becoming a uh, standards track? There is on applicability. Uh, there's a home net document, of course, on the use of payroll, and there's a talk there, so people can go look at the slides from that if they're interested in uh, profiling a level for home net. There are a number of uh, personal drafts, including the information model, which is a target at becoming a label draft. And there are the existing experimental RFCs. So we did adopt these uh, milestones here, which we've gotten some initial adoption of drafts. 
but uh, do need to uh, get a information model graph adopted, although there is, perhaps uh, we can do that fairly soon, and uh, progress these documents through uh, the process and head them towards being standard track RFCs when appropriate. Any questions on that sort of stuff? Okay, so uh, initially, our initial topic here is on particularly on the drafts and how they are going and what the questions are related to them. By Julius, do you want to come up and? Thank you. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Oh, um, let's see. We may be able to set things up so you have control yourself. Or... Okay. I'm fine with that. So, hello. I'd like to tell you a few words today about a few Babel drafts. About a few Babel drafts. Is that better? Next, please. Okay. So, Right now, I am the editor of five drafts related to Babel, which are two base drafts and that are in scope for this working group, which is the uh, new version of the specification, RFC 2616 BIS, and that's something that's urgent. The applicability statement for Babel, which is urgent, and three extension drafts which are out of scope, for this working group, as far as I know, source-specific routing, and that's something that is urgent because HomeNet relies on that, and unfortunately, it's going to change quite a bit in the following weeks or months. I'm going to say a few words. There's RTT-based routing, so that's a mature specification that has been deployed in production for a long time, and there is no reason why it should change and it is not urgent, it's completely ready, it just needs to be submitted, but I've been advised that as long as 2616 BIS is not ready, it would be a bad idea to ask to put it in final call. That's very surprising, that's very frustrating, especially for the student who did the work. And there's diversity-based routing, that's something that I'm excited about, but it's neither ready nor urgent, so I'm not going to speak about it. I'm not really happy at being the editor of five documents, but that's what happens when you work with students. So the students do the work, they do some brilliant work, you think that's really great, let's write it up as a draft, and then the students leave to do other fun stuff, and you remain stuck with the job of pushing that through the IETF. Next, please. So, I'm going, so uh, 6126 bis is the merger of two informational individual submission RFCs, which are 6126 and 7557. And while we are at it, we are obviously doing any bug fixes to any known bugs that we've found in the old RFCs. We're doing whatever clarifications are deemed to be needed. And we have decided, so that was Berlin or Prague, I think it was Berlin where we decided that we allow uh, ourselves to make weakly compatible changes. That's a polite way of saying technically incompatible, but it doesn't matter. The idea being is that it's okay to break the letter of the informational RFCs, but we don't want to be breaking deployed implementations. So there's no good term for that. I call it weakly compatible. Um, next, please. So a few words about the old RFC. 6126 was published in 2011 after an excruciating review by Joel Halpern, who uh, was extremely helpful over a period of a good six months. And since then, we've done four important extensions. We've had three, but every time I check, there is one more. So uh, I think it might actually be four independent re-implementations of Babel, and we have found a few bugs and omissions in this pack because the implementation work was very helpful, and it still turns out to be good enough for independent implementation. Next, please. Now, 
at the time I wrote 6126, I knew I wanted a extensible protocol, but I didn't know what extensions would look like. So what 6126 says, look, there's space here, and if you see anything in this space, you just silently ignore it, because I didn't know what the data would look like. And a few years later, after we had implemented, tested, and deployed a number of extensions, we decided to formalize what extensions look like, and that's what 7557 was. So at the time, the reviewer 7557 was a little bit nervous, saying, are you sure that existing implementations do obey the letter of this spec? Do they actually ignore the uh, extension data? And the answer was yes, because I've checked, because I knew from the beginning that I was going to dump extension data into there. So to summarize 7557, it says, this is what sub-TLVs look like. You put them there, and it doesn't say the other place that was free in 6126 was the packet trailer after the series of TLVs, and it ended up not being used by any extension. So what 7557 says, is that a future specification might or might not define what the packet trailer looks like. For now, don't use it. Uh, the fact that those are two different RFCs is due to pu purely historical reasons, and so it's a natural thing to ask to merge them. Next, please. Okay, so how is 6126 progressing, 6126BIS progressing? The bug fixes, as far as I know, are done. I've been through all my list of, you know, we all have 20,000 text files in our home directory with random things. I think every, all of us index stuff in the same manner that is not at all. So I've been through everything that looked Babel related, all of my notes. And as far as I'm aware, I have fixed all the known bugs in 6126. The clarifications that are needed are neighbor acquisition and sending of requests, and I'm going to expand on that in a while. The merger of 7557 is in progress. I'm going to expand on that in a while. As to the weekly compatible changes, there are unicast hellos and uh, re the redefinition of updates, and that's tricky, that needs to be done, and I'm definitely going to speak about it in, this, in a second. Next, please. Okay, so neighbor acquisition. Uh, RFC 6126 does not tell you when you acquire a neighbor. So the way it is written is that once you have dumped a neighbor in your neighbor data structure, you may exchange routing data with them. And at no point does it say at which point exactly you acquire the neighbor. And the reason for that is that from the point of view of Babel, it just doesn't matter. It's a distance vector protocol. The only condition is if you want to speak with me at some point, you will need to acquire me as a neighbor. And there was a very technical discussion on the mailing list with four or five participants. So I'm sorry if any of you felt excluded, but that's the nature of the thing. Sometimes you need to have and actually discuss details of the data structures. And there was a majority opinion, which was to leave it vague. We like it this way. All of our implementations do it differently. Okay, just leave it vague and put some implementation advice. There are two natural points at which you can acquire a neighbor. Either the first time you receive a well-formed Babel packet from a node, the other opportunity is the first time you manage to parse a hello TLV from a given node. Okay, and that, so just say that those are the two natural places, but the, all that the spec is going to say is uh, you must acquire a neighbor in a timely manner. And there was a minority opinion, a very vocal but minority opinion, which was to specify precisely to use a finite state automaton and to say exactly at which point what is the protocol for acquiring a neighbor. And this apparently fixes a security problem with uh, HMAC-based security. So my reading of this discussion, and I happen to belong to the majority opinion, is to leave it vague. And one thing that I'm considering, and I would like some opinions on that, is to allow extensions to tighten the rules. On the one hand, it would make HMAC security happy. On the other hand, I'm not really comfortable with the notion to say, look, this is a basic procedure of the protocol. Oh, by the way, extensions can change it. 
So I'd like to know uh, if there are any other opinions than what was already expressed on the list, I would like to hear them. Hi, David Skenazi, Apple. Um, to slightly say differently what you were saying, um, I'm fine with, I think the best solution here is I'm also part of the majority opinion is to say that if the HMAC based security has a requirement to tighten something up, that document should define that. I don't think we should allow them to modify how things work, but slightly constraining more in a way that is compatible with what the original document seems okay. As in extensions can say, by the way, this fundamental part of the alg uh, algorithm, which can be done in A or B, you need to do this if you support this extension. I think that's okay as long as that doesn't break any of the uh, things that are in the original RFC. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does, and that is exactly what makes me uncomfortable, because it means that for some implementations, it will be more difficult than for others to implement HMAC security. Oh, OK. Point. So the point here is that you expect an extension to be something that you can add to your implementation, whatever the implementation choices you made. If implementing an extension requires you to redo your implementation from scratch, although you did obey the original protocol, then I think this is a badly designed extension. I can't disagree with that. Uh, would it be possible in this particular case, I need to remember through it, it's been a while, that to change the HMAC based security to work, given that vagueness and that other implementations do it a different way? We don't, we would have to look more into it. I have no idea. Somebody okay. would have to, as a second person, would have to look very carefully at HMAC security. It's a hint. I can take a look. Uh, to be clear, that is, I am not a security expert, so I can say what might work. I can't give you security properties or something. <laughs> The one thing I know about security is that I don't know enough about security. Once again, sorry. If you want a real security review of anything, send it to the security directorate. I mean, the chair should be able to do that, and they would be able to get us some feedback probably. Um, I mean, I could look at it first if we want to look for low-hanging fruit, but I assume it was written by somebody who knows 80% about security, too, or more. Oh, yeah, Liz. So I haven't looked at the details, but one of the ways that sometimes we do specifications, as you might say, uh, the output or the result has to conform to what would be if the implementation were doing this algorithm or this finite state machine. So the outputs have to be compatible, but the internal logic doesn't have to be. I don't know if that type of approach might help with the gap, because I haven't looked at the requirements. Could you repeat, please? Sometimes we specify that um, an implementation has to have an output that looks like the result of as if the implementation had run this yeah. finite okay. state machine. It doesn't have to do the machine. It just has to be compatible with in well-defined ways. I don't know if that would help finesse here because I haven't looked at the details. I'm, I'm not sure mm -hmm. that applies here. It's a, some sort of problem is that if you don't redo neighbor acquisition at the right time, you become vulnerable to replays. And I'm not uh, really I'm not I'm, I'm not I'm not really clear on the details. So I really wouldn't want to say too much. Uh, next, please. Okay, so Babel, so I've tried to design Babel as a rather robust protocol. And by robust here, I mean that no matter how bad an implementer you are, you're not going to break much because the protocol is resistant to all sorts of implementation errors. And there is one bit, so I've tried in many cases, there is a big temptation to do tricky optimizations in a protocol. I've tried to refrain as much as possible. 
and you know that I work with students, so I was under a lot of, and students like to be smart, so you know that I was under a lot of pressure to be too smart for the good of the protocol. And I'm proud to say that most of the time I refrained from being smart. And there is one bit that I didn't manage to make as robust as I want. There is one bit that is actually tricky. It is when to send requests. So for people who are just a quick comment for people who are not familiar with the protocol, uh, there are some cir circumstances in which Babel is starving, knows that it does have roots, but is not allowed to use them because of the loop avoidance protocol. And at this point, it will send some requests, which is somewhat similar to EIGRP's active phase, but completely different. And uh, uh, this bit, I've reread it multiple times, and I have to say that it is an absolute mess in this spec. It is absolutely terribly written, and to my great surprise, even that is good enough for independent re-implementation. So many kudos to the people who did manage to re-implement Babel correctly, notwithstanding my very dubious prose. This bit needs to be rewriting, rewritten, and while I was looking at it, I realized that at the time I didn't fully understand the issues, I was a little bit too prescriptive, so I'm going to make it a little bit more permissive. I have a proof that it remains correct. I don't have a proof that this is actually the minimum requirement, but I have, I'm pretty sure we're pretty close to the minimum requirements. That should be no problem. And I've described it all in an email to the mailing list. Next, please. Okay, unicast hellos. So one of the design criteria in Babel is that all TLDs can be sent over unicast or, or over multicast. Whether you're sending them over unicast or multicast is purely an implementation detail, and you deal with it like you want, with one exception, the hello TLD. So it is natural to ask that hellos be sent over multicast because hellos are used for discovery, but once you've discovered your neighbors, you might want to send hellos over unicast, and you cannot do that. So you cannot do that first because I say so in 6126. I say must not, you know, in capital, in capital letters, and that means you really must not. And the other reason is that if you do, then you might want to send a hello to one neighbor and not another one. However, hellos carry a sequence number, and the sequence number is per interface. So you'll end up with a desynchronization between the sequence numbers. Uh, now, there are at least four people and at least three active implementers, so things have evolved since I wrote the slides last time, who are clamoring for unicast hello, Some, something has to be done. I think it would be a terrible wasted opportunity if we missed the, uh, if we missed the, if we missed RFC uh, 6126 this and didn't do unicast hellos in it. And I would really like the people who are interested to get into a virtual room at some point and work out a workable design that satisfies all the requirements. So, um, so what we did and what I was attempting to propose in the mail, I said, but maybe wasn't clear enough, is that every time we would have sent a broadcast hello uh, according to the current implementation, we serialized. So we sent to every peer on that interface a hello, every time. Whether it was because of an interval, whether it was because uh, it was triggered somehow, any time we were going to send any hello, it would have gone out broadcast under the normal implementation, and we just sent it to every peer on that interface. Um, that's simplistic, but it works, and it doesn't change the protocol at all. Right. So the important bit here is that you are sending a hello either to all neighbors on a given internet, uh, interface or none. Exactly. So you're not risking desynchronizing SECMOS. We were now, simply serializing the sending, all the way Absolutely. down at the sending. <laughs> and that means that it doesn't change the protocol at all. And now, you could do other things that are more complicated. but And that's perfectly correct. Now, my question, so that is one possibility to say that in 6126-bis. Now the question is, is this ambitious enough, or do you actually want to be able to send a hello to one neighbor and not the other? I thought your point about I hear you's was good, was it was a good point. Um, I think it probably should be possible to include the I hear you to the neighbor it applies to, 
and send the hello to the other neighbors on the same link at the same time without the I hear you. But my proposal doesn't actually say that, and we probably should. But other than that, that's what I was proposing because that's what we implemented, so I know that works. Um, I'd be willing to discuss other things, but I'd like to see them work. Donald Sharp, so when I implemented remote neighbors in EIGRP, I actually made it so that you could send the unicast hello just so, so that I could get the packet to whoever I was trying to talk to. Do you have concerns about having neighbors that aren't one hop away, more than one hop away in Babel? Not in ERGP. I mean, you can fudge that if so you want. So what I've been doing is trying, trying to refrain from doing stuff that the users are not asking for. And so all I'm going to say is that none of the users have asked for that none of the users have asked for multi-hub neighbor neighborships neighborhoods neighbor relationships okay we have an external person wanting to speak so that oh sorry go ahead I do. Uh, uh, we can't hear you <laughs> Oh, no, we pressed the button. We see you, but we can't hear you. Is your microphone on? <laughs> well. <laughs> we could cycle through this again. I could uh, push the red button twice. Uh, uh, you could try it, but it might just come out. Okay. Oh, yeah, but I mean, he can. Uh, okay, you've been kicked out, so you should ask to get back in again. Otherwise, we have someone on Jabber. Yeah, here. yeah, so what Dave had typed, Dave Tad had typed into Jabber was a question for you, Margaret, uh, which is what if you have a mix of multicast and unicast capable receivers? And how do you signal other nodes that you are unicast capable? <laughs> um, I don't, I mean, my implementation currently, it's, it's a very specialized implementation that is actually for a different use. It's actually for an AbFab related protocol and it runs over GSS API. Uh, every Babel message is a GSA API token running over an encrypted TCP connection. So I know I don't have any multicast related <laughs> anything. Uh, there are also non-multicast networks. Um, my guess is that we're probably not going to want to support. I'm secure with some of my neighbors, and I'm insecure with others of my neighbors. Um, so I, I think you would, it would be an either or. But if someone came up with a real life use case where people needed to support both, I'd be happy to put in a lot of thought. But right now, I, I'm, I'm not sure what the use case would be to support some unicast neighbors and some multicast neighbors. I mean, if you had peer to peer neighbors, they're just another interface. Right? Like, so I can't come up with one where I've got a group of unicast neighbors on the same interface and a group of multicast neighbors, I don't know, on another interface? I'm not sure. I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure what the scenario would be. David Skenazi. I, I think there... David is talking and we still can't hear him, so if he says anything... Oh. Sorry, not sure how I turned into job or scribe, but happy to help. Uh, Toki says, uh, asks, asking about a Wi-Fi bridge to Ethernet um, as an example. And Dave Tat uh, asked, uh, plunk a new generation of Babel D in an existing network. So those were a couple. That's true. My implementation does its own stuff too, but I can see like at least from what I've been hearing about the current Babel community, they can run different versions and everything should still work. And uh, I think getting something that would support the interaction and also not required setting to anyone shouldn't be too complicated. We would, I definitely agree we should get in a room and bash it out. And room could be a virtual room, uh, should be. And um, but like having something as simple as like in your periodic multicast hellos that are those are used for discovery. You could have a bit saying I support this. 
and then have a separate set of sequence numbers. And I think that could be good enough. I had thought about this, but I haven't reread my notes, so I could be off. Uh, okay, so we definitely need to get in a, into a room. I would say unicast hellos have no sequence number, just an interval. The sequence number is for extra robustness if you change the interval. I would have a minimalistic unicast hello. Well, a smart guy came up with a short solution. I love it. So unless anyone has a requirement, unless anyone has an actual requirement of having data in unicast hellos, I would make the unicast hello a tiny, tiny packet with no data or with just an interval depending on. Okay, maybe we should move on or uh, if, if one, real quick. Yes, yeah, a very short point. Like another thing that I had done at some point in my implementation was that just receiving a unicast message from someone, what I would treat it as a hello. And if your hello just doesn't include anything else, that would be similar. Um, Russ White, LinkedIn. As a matter of fact, many routing protocols do consider any packet received from a neighbor as a hello, even if it's not technically a hello. So, some protocols, like EDGE or P, will actually send what is effectively an empty unicast packet because it knows the other end will go, oh, that was a hello, I keep this guy alive. So it's not even defined as a hello per se. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's Kanazi. Uh, but I do like the idea of an empty hello because just somewhere down the road, that means that it's explicitly defined for what it means. Anyway, we can okay, so discuss just quickly this to answer Russ, yeah. you want to be able to attach sub TLDs even to the unicast hello, which fails if you treat an empty packet of hello. Next, please. So okay, so integration of six of six five five seven into six one two six conceptually easy editorially tricky. There have been three attempts. So the first one was very helpful by Toki, and I'm very grateful to Toki because he showed me what doesn't work. That is, he just took 7557, did some editing of the stuff, and put it as a separate section, which seemed like a good idea. And it turned out to not read very well, because you end up with a document that says, here you have the TLDs, here there is nothing, Oh, by the way, I lied to you earlier, there are sub-TLDs at this point. So what I wanted was to integrate the sub-TLD format at the right point in the document. And I tried that in December, that's attempt two. And I started editing the document, and at some point it was a complete mess. And so I started trying to fix the mess, and at some point it got so bad that I decided to throw everything out and to quit, and to abandon my job and to leave for holidays. And so I tried again recently, and this time, so I let it work in my brain, and this time I got something that works. It does read correctly, except that it feels a little bit like, you know, an American series from the 1970s, like Dallas or Dynasty or something like that, where you go and there's a lot of drama, okay, like this is the format of TLVs and everyone is crying and having his text. And then at the end he, you say, oh, by the way, you resolve the drama by saying, by the way, we don't define any sub-TLVs in this document. So except for the somewhat imbalance, it does appear to work pretty well, and I didn't make it in time before the cutoff to send it to you all. We'll do pretty soon. Next, please. So before I tell you about the semi-compatible changes that we are planning, I need to make a quick digression about source-specific routing. I'm not going to tell you what source-specific routing is, but it's the best thing since somebody invented next hop routing. It is the most exciting extension that we've done in Babel. It is the work of Mathieu Boutier, my grad student, and that is something that I'm very, very excited about. It works beautifully well in Babel. It is a production-ready implementation. There are a few people who are deploying it in real networks, and the packet format is an absolute mess. We define three new TLVs 
And trust me, those TLVs are not pretty at all. They have way too many fields. They resemble nothing like the other TLVs in Babel. Implementing, it is impossible to decode them on site. They are even after working on that for months. And that's really not a pretty site. Next, please. And so we would like to change the packet format. And one thing would be to add a mandatory bit to sub TLVs. OK, so have the source prefix information for source specific routing appear as a sub TLV of the normal update TLV, but marked with a mandatory bit so that if you don't understand this sub TLV, you drop the whole TLV. And that doesn't make me comfortable. It doesn't fit well into Babel. It's not obvious what the semantics of the mandatory bit would be in Babel. And especially, there is a problem is that you can no longer parse a packet sequentially. Because if you find in a sub TLV a mandatory bit that you don't understand, suddenly you have to roll back all the changes you, you made since you started parsing the TLV. Not a problem if you're clean at implementing your code because you're building a data structure, but if you're doing things on the fly because you're me, then it is an actual implementation problem. The other solution is to use the AE mechanism, which is already in Babel. Next, please. So every update and request in Babel carries a one octet field known as the address encoding. So think of it as being the address family. It's a field that tells you this is IPv4, IPv6, or IPv10. However, uh, it's, I don't call it an address family because it carries some more information. You can say things like, this is a compressed IPv6 link local address without the FE80 prefix and stuff like that. So it's actually the encoding of an address. And the idea here would be to recode source-specific routing by using a new, I, a new AE for source-specific updates and requests. Next, please. So what that means is that you no longer have three new TLVs. You have zero new TLVs, just a new AE value. But you need changes to the base specification because updates have too rigid a format right now for, uh, to be able to carry source-specific updates. And you need to define very precisely how address compression, I don't, won't get into the details, works with unknown AEs. So we've got, there's three of us having this discussion back in Paris, and that doesn't prevent us from having almost three different opinions, which is pretty good. I mean, we've already managed to have four opinions while well, there were three of us. Um, one opinion, which is the current favorite, and is due to Mathieu Boutier, so he's convinced me, is to make the payload of updates opaque. So an update just says there is some data after the header. If you don't understand the ID, just skip the whole TLV and no structure at all. So the problem with that is that you have to parse every single AE separately. The other problem with that is that you cannot parse the sub-TLVs of a TLV that you understand, but you don't understand the AE. The nice side is that it is very flexible. The other opinion, which was originally mine, is to make it as precise as possible to encode both source-specific updates and normal updates. And then we recently, the team was joined by an MSc student, Gwendolyn Schwann, and Gwendolyn has been there for two weeks, but that doesn't prevent her from already disagreeing from us, which is a very good sign. And she's saying, just stop with this whole AE mess, just use a mandatory bit. Okay, Gwendolyn has some BGP experience from the previous internship. And so uh, since we are disagreeing, that probably means that we need more data. We need more examples of the use of AE. And that means Gwendolyn is currently working on TOS routing for Babel. And we need to see how beer gets encoded if the people who are working on beer with, uh, for Babel are interested in that. When I um, learned about this yesterday, I actually thought that um, the mandatory bit was right. Okay, even though you were saying you thought the other one was right. But then I happened to read over the whole document since then. <laughs> um, and it occurred to me that if you don't know the AE, then, I mean, you're not just going to run 
Babel. I mean, the point is to run Babel so you can have information about how to forward packets, what direction to forward packets in. But if you don't know the AE for a particular type of route, you're not going to know how to use it to forward packets anyway, are you? So I think it's perfectly fine to make it opaque. And if like you know about that AE, you process it. If you don't, you don't, because how are you going to know what to use it for? If it's for an address family, you don't understand. I don't. So, the main so, so I changed my opinion since yesterday to make it opaque. So the main question is, do you need to be able to parse sub-TLVs of an update TLV with an AE that you don't understand? That's the main issue. And I, David Skenazi, Apple. And I totally agree. And same, like my implementation doesn't support IPv4. And if there are update, like sub-TLVs of any kind of all like fancy properties of this IPv4 address, I, like what am I going to do with them? Like is there an example of a case where this this address that does something, but we have extensions, but you only want the extensions? Like I don't see that ever happening. Or, or do, do you have an idea in mind? And it would be bad if you forwarded them to other people implying you could forward those packets because you can't. So the best thing to do is not to put them in your table. I agree. Next, next. Okay, so that's the end. That's all I had to say about 6126bis for now. I'm going to give you a few words about the Babel applicability statement. How much time do you I can skip plenty of time. Uh, you know, uh, why don't you try to finish up in five minutes, is that? Okay. Oh, okay. David's in the queue? Uh, However... Uh, we still can't hear you. Can you type in the Java, please? What Dave said on the jabber is AE is good. I do kind of think we end up with more than one new AE. Do we end up with a mirror image of the existing four AEs? And by the way, Toke says, Bird will also drop the entire TLV if it doesn't understand the AE. Dave says AE, for sake of argument, MPLS? What other AEs are possibly needed? Thanks, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> one, uh, David Skenazi, one point I would like to add, and we can discuss it offline, is this only works if you restrict the address encoding uh, compression to be specific to an encoding, which I think is what yes. you wanted to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. That requires some very careful looking at compatibility with unknown AEs. Yeah. Okay, so the Babel applicability statement. At some point I discovered to my great horror that I had to write an applicability that an applicability statement was desired by the IETF for Babel. So it has so this applicability statement has a long history. The first version was one sentence long. It said it's a routing protocol, it roots. And that was considered as too short. So then I wrote a document that I called Babel Doesn't Care, and that was considered too funny. And then I wrote the last version, which I called Applicability Statement, and that was considered too sober. So I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you about my literary experiences with the Applicability Statement. Next, please. So my first version was one sentence long. It said, it's a routing protocol for goodness sake, it's roots. And the friendly AD <laughs> considered that it was too short. I think she mentioned that while technically correct, this is somewhat too short. <laughs> so I wanted to make it two sentence long, but while the AD is friendly, I was afraid she might no longer find it funny at that point. <laughs> so I spent a whole Sunday afternoon reading applicability statements. Next, please. 
So I don't know if you've ever spent a whole afternoon reading applicability statements. It has an effect on your brain. It does change you. And at that point, I sat down, and by 2 a.m., I had produced a document that was called Babel Doesn't Care. And this document I sent, I submitted straight away before I could think it over as an internet draft. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I'm going to do, you know, like English language books tend to have on the dust cover those made up quotations. So those are not made up. Those are authentic. So one of the quotations was, this is the best IETF draft ever. That was not Donald Trump. It's a different DT here. And the other comment by someone whose initials are TL is reminds me of the honey badger. So if you don't know about the honey badger, after this meeting is over, just go on over to YouTube and type, type honey badger. And another person who was actually helpful sent me a long email trying to be polite, but you felt the irritation between the lines. And he said, look, it's not an applicability statement. You're just bragging. It's funny, but really you're just bragging. So I read it. I was really quite frustrated by this comment. That's not a nice thing because I'm a very modest person. I like to think so. And <laughs> so uh, I read through it and I said, damn, he's right. Next, please. And so I said, OK, I'm going to write a very sober document. And I wrote an extremely sober document called Babel Applicability Statement. How sad. And uh, this, in this document, I swear I didn't do any bragging at all. I just soberly described existing deployments of Babel. And this document spent quite a few months maturing in the ITF archives. And then I called Donald and said, uh, look, what do we do with that? And Donald did the typical Donald thing, which consisted in sending it straight away for final call. And there was a review, next please. And there was an extremely helpful review by someone I didn't know, Alexander Weinstein, who did a great job. So it's a long review because he's trying to be polite. But if you remove all the bits where, he, where he's trying not to wound my feelings, the main three points he's making is that he needs an introduction, he needs more precise data about the existing deployments, and he wants to know which extensions are being used. So I strongly agree with points one and three here. This document needs an introduction, and this document needs more information about the extensions. I don't necessarily disagree with point two. It would be a good idea, but it might be a lot of work, not only getting the precise quantitative data, but convincing the people who deploy Babel that I'm allowed to publish their quantitative data. So point two is something I am going to take into account, but I'm going to do it only if the amount of effort necessary remains reasonable. Uh, Julius, yeah. this is Russ from LinkedIn with my chair hat off. I will say normally in the IETF process, precise data about existing deployments is not something that I would think of when I think of an applicability statement. It's something I would think of when I think of an experience with protocol X draft. So I think you're perfectly safe leaving that out of this document until more experience that is more open that can be discussed is available. And writing a completely separate document at that time called an experience with Bible deployments document when that time comes. I, I, I don't think you need it for this document, personally. Good to, good to know. Uh, it, you know, if I could, uh, Donald, uh, so I believe the status of this was that there was not really enough response to the word group call, and uh, but so I thought it should be modified and uh, do another word group last call after these changes through in response to this comment were made. That's my remember. That's what I remember the status to be. Uh, I could be wrong. But. Okay. So next, please. So the plan here is to have a complete draft of 6126 bis by Prague. And the two things that worry me are the unicast hello bit and the redefinition of updates. So that also depends on Gwendoline's work. Um, we 
also plan for a complete draft of the applicability statement in Prague. And the main uh, and the main stumbling block here is that it's extremely boring work, especially if I'm not allowed to brag. And um, we will hopefully have a new draft uh, of source-specific routing with the new encoding. And depending on how Gwendoline's work does uh, goes, we might have a draft for TOS routing. So what I'm saying here is that we are aiming to do it in Prague. I have, so there are of course the official deadlines of the ATF, but there is another deadline for me is that in September teaching starts. And that means I'm completely out of circulation for any stuff except teaching. So for me, it's a vital thing to get all of this done before July. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Any further questions or comments? Okay. <laughs> So um, the next is a talk on multicast extension. Good afternoon, I'm Sam Dizan from ZTE. Um, this afternoon, I want to share my idea about uh, multicast Babel extension. Um, I list uh, many quest uh, questions about uh, if we will use multicast in the small network, but I think we have explicit answer about the first uh, four questions because we do need multicast in small network and we will we want to simple the de network deployment to reach the reach reach, reach my uh, reach us reach, reach our sorry <laughs> reach our goals mm. so mm, in last meeting i presented the mm, beer extension in babel and uh, it's it had been Good discussed uh, about the uh, deployment, and many people thinks, uh, thinks, think it is useful. Um, and now the question come, uh, the problem coming. Um, we know if we want to deploy beer technology in small network, we must uh, we can use Babel as underlay protocol for it. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we must run MLD to transfer the overlay information. The overlay information includes uh, multicast source information and uh, group information. So the receiver and the so sender will know who, who uh, are each other. So he will exchange the information and uh, know the, how to uh, send the beer packet. Um, but if, if it existed the network that uh, some network want only one protocol, uh, I don't need uh, MLD, I only want Babel. If this network exists, I, I, don't, I have no idea about it. So, so this is my idea about it. I wanted to um, have discussion with our people to, to think at it should be forward, move forward, or it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So the solution is very simple. We only use one protocol in network, just as before, Babel. So we use Babel to build the beer multicast forwarding plane. And at the same time, we use Babel to advertise multicast information, include the uh, source information and uh, the group information. Uh, LHR means the last hop router. It means the router that near the receiver. Uh, who wants to receive the multicast flow? Uh, LHR leverages Babel extension to uh, 
send the request that um, oh who uh, which blue I want it. And the FHR means that the first hop router, then it's the router that is near the source. FHR collects the requirements of LHRS and builds mapping relationship between multicast flow and the beer destination bitstream. And the, uh, the format is very simple because we only use the uh, sub TLV of the Babel prefix. So we advertise the group address and the source address in it. Um, the source address may be zero because we um, some receiver only know I, I want to receive some group and I don't know the source. So he will send the uh, sub TLV with only the uh, group address, no source address. Uh, so this is uh, a multicast small network. Um, LHR, we know uh, there, may, there may be many LHRs. And uh, FH, well, F, how FHR know um, who, the, who, is, uh, who are the LHRs? So um, we use Babel update message to transfer the multicast source information and the group information. Uh, and uh, the prefix must not be summarized. So this information can be transferred to every node in the network and uh, the potentially source or FHR will know the potentially receivers. So it will mapping the LHRS bit, um, bit operation into the beer stream, the beer bit stream. So it, it can encapsulate the packet and transfer to all the receivers. So it's a very simple idea. <laughs> any, any comments? That's all. Okay, so I've read both versions of your draft. And so I mentioned that after your last presentation on the subject, which is Babel does not have a notion of a transitive optional sub TLV. Okay, yes. that is not something you can encode in Babel because simply the transitive bit doesn't exist. Right? So you well, need it, to it, find it, a different encoding. And that is what I mentioned when I was speaking earlier about the fact about updates is that we are now in the process of trying to find out what is the right way to uh, encode this card kind of information in Babel. So perhaps we'll come to the conclusion that we do need mandatory and transitive bits. But our current thinking right now is that this can be done with a different AE number. Now, if you look at this slide of what you're writing here, you're saying, look, I'm encoding this as a prefix. Yeah. But this prefix, it's weird. It has different semantics. Yeah, You're not yeah. allowed to aggregate it. So actually, it looks like a prefix, but it's not really a prefix, right? So that would seem to imply that it's a new AE number, that it should be, not be encoded like this. The other comment, if you can come back to the previous slide, the one with the packet format. Uh, so Babel is designed to be implemented in tonight's, I think that's the shortest implementation. And in particular, it does not have a recursive parser. So it's not like an ISIS where you can have TLVs within TLVs within TLVs within TLVs until you reach the turtles all the way down. Yeah. It's <laughs> what Babel does is very simple. You have a packet. In the packet, you have a sequence of TLVs. Every TLV has its payload and sub TLVs. We don't have sub sub TLVs. Okay, it's not recursive. Okay, so here you are in your encoding. And as I've said, I think that there are good reasons why this is not the encoding that we want. But in your encoding, you're introducing for the first time in Babel a sub sub TLV. Now, perhaps there's good reason. Perhaps we do need sub sub TLVs. Okay, but my, my feeling here would be 
that we should not introduce a third level of TLVs unless we're convinced that we really have a good reason why we need them. Okay. Uh, I think we should uh, change the format for it. Maybe we only use sub-TLV is enough. <laughs> So, okay. no, I would say that what we do want for beer would be a new AE number, okay, and not encoded as a sub as a subtype. New AE number, uh, I know, you mean that uh, we use a new AE for beer and we will not use a sub TLV, really, yeah. And uh, I must clarify that this document is not uh, uh, the same as the document that I presented in Thor meeting. In Thor meeting, it's the beer extension, and this is uh, multicast information extension. It uh, carried uh, different things in it. Uh, yeah, beer extension is uh, impossible. So I, be, I want to know if this is needed. So David Skenazi, Apple. Uh, so I don't know much about beer, but I wanted to ask, uh, what's the status of the implementation for this? Uh, we have built a project of beer uh, in ODL, Open Daylight, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we will do some work about beer bubble extension. And this document means that we will transfer the multicast information through bubble. So if this Draft is makes sense, we will do the job. I, and I think it's one of the founding principles of the ITF is that you write the code first and that's how you find out if your draft makes sense. Because that's, because sometimes you can have something that looks perfect, like for me, it makes sense. I don't see anything wrong about it, apart the points that Joyce made that I agree with. Um, but you could write it and then realize that it doesn't work. Like I've done that many times before. So I think if we were to move forward with this document as a working group, we would like to hear your experience deploy, like implementing it and deploying it first. I think that is a f first step for us to move forward. I, un I understand what you are concerned, mm, but we I have discussed it with many experts in team working group or beer working group. Nothing is as good as running code, though. Okay. <laughs> okay, running code is the first. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we do encourage running code. And in this working group, there is general agreement that really get some code in place to see what's going on. As Julia says, it doesn't take a lot to do some of to the implementation and there are open source implementations out there where you can take what you have for your ideas and see how well they play out and see what happens when you try and do something. So while there are many drafts in different areas where in different working groups where there is, there is not such a strong emphasis on having an implementation first, in this working group, there is a desire to have that as a good baseline because it's fairly straightforward. And because it doesn't have the same decades, sorry, of history that some of the existing protocols do that make us know how to extend it. It's just the religion of this working group. Right. Second, because you said you weren't very familiar with beer. Um, I think this is a really good idea. Okay. I think that, sorry, not the details of the encapsulations, but HomeNet does have the desire to have multicast. Where your routers, where you're doing most of your forwarding and software, or if you get this, get some of the beer forwarding pieces taped out, but where you have software implementations doing some of the forwarding. It's a bitmap. It's a fundamental paradigm shift from doing longest prefix map prefix match to looking at a bitmap. And it means that you don't need to have something like PIM or another multicast protocol, which I think has a lot of potential to simplify the home environment. So 
I would encourage you to read up a little bit on beer to see, because I think if it were done right and there were the interest that it has potential. Okay. Are there any other comments? I guess we could move on. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Alia is going to. So oh, no, Dave Julius Unjabber. is going to channel Dave. There's Dave and Jabber who said, I would like very much for Babel to remain parsable with a forward only parser such as this followed with a link, uh, which can be expressed in Verilog. I can no longer even raise my hand. Barbara, if you could mention mine. So. <laughs> Thank you, Julius. You did an excellent job of channeling Barbara, channeling Dave. <laughs> and by the way, I got it. Is Gabrielle not in the room? Is Gabrielle only on like Meet Echo? Well, Gabrielle's doing a great job of also helping with the minute, so I just wanted to give a shout okay. out to that. Okay. Thank you, Gabrielle. So anyway, um, I hastily threw this together in preparation for this meeting, and I just feel so bad I haven't put enough time in it. But anyway, next slide. This is about the information model that is part of the charter. Um, and I did make some changes to um, the draft that I submitted way back in Berlin. Um, and I went back and I dragged out Julius' email where he recommended changes, and I tried to apply them, and I just failed because I actually missed some of the stuff he said. But so be it. Um, these are the changes. I'm not going to go through them because they're, like, really detailed, but there's the one I missed. It will be in the next revision. Um, and here I think there was some where I said I need to understand this better, and I'll take that to the list. I, I think it may be... Um, it may be better for it not to be done verbally, but rather in typing format. Um, and here were just some other things um, that I did. And then the one thing I did want to ask about is the last slide, where there had been discussion back in Berlin about trying to introduce some statistics into the model. And I really didn't have anything concrete to do with that. And so if anybody does want to introduce some statistics, if they could just throw out some ideas on the email list or something like that, that would be great. Any comments? Woohoo! <laughs> I'll just mention that I've got three students this summer working on speaking to a Babel demon and extracting stuff from the Babel demon and drawing pretty pictures on screen. And if you have actual suggestions of what data they should be producing. I mean, producing some JSON or whatever, once they are speaking to the Babel demon should be no problem. I'm sure they will be willing to do it. So like maybe an XML format kind of thing? Can we do JSON? JSON? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't care. It's all the same. But yeah, I could do JSON. OK. That would that would be very consistent with what I would then also do in for TR69. So what I mean is that if you could provide them with some guidance yeah. about what is worth provide pr worth producing, mm -hmm. I'm sure that could be that would be helpful. Yeah. Well, Aaliyah is saying you could do Yang and JSON. Yes, but of course I don't do Yang as well as I know broadband form, but, you know, we'll, we'll see about that. I, I do hear you. <laughs> but if we have the information model, I think we can find somebody to help with some of the yang. Exactly. Okay. But if you're looking at playing with it in the summer, where I'd start is the information onto here's the yang model, and then you can implement it with a JSON encapsulation, and it would be right. But since nice. I, 
do actually intend to bring this into broadband form, for me personally, it will make sense to go ahead and start working on the uh, broadband form model. Oh, absolutely. That's why we have the information model in the charter is for both cases. Okay. So I, I guess the people feel, I mean, it seems to me that probably after one more rev uh, or the personal draft, we could do a call for adoption. I mean, we're sort of working on it as it is. I mean, I don't know. Or is there a consensus that we should adopt it and work on it as a working group document? I mean, Not necessarily, but it, you know, everything seems to be now. moving along reasonably with the, so. Uh, I mean, I, I read the previous version. I, I'm sorry, I didn't read this one, but um, it sounds like it was even improved from there. And I usually think you can make something a working group document if you think it's a really good basis for the working group to start. And I would have said the previous one was good enough. So I'm all for like making a call to make it a working group item. I think we can just do it as chair. But Okay, so uh, we should also revise it via working group draft. Next time okay, so the next revision I will submit is a working yep. group draft through you. Okay. We'll, we'll it. Yay. As a working group draft. Okay. okay. So that's kind of uh, the agenda. If there's anything else anybody wants to bring up, now would be a good time. If not, uh, I guess we will adjourn until Prague. I'll see you on the mailing list in, uh, in Prague. Thank you very much. You can go back to babbling now. Uh, the blue uh, sheet should come back to the head table in one way or another, and anybody who did not, uh, yes, uh, we could bring them up or whatever. Anybody who didn't sign should do so.